Okay, Tim's did bits. Um, everybody should know how to use the command line. Um, here are some useful commands you may not know about um, that will help you use the command line better. First thing is a bunch of W word um, commands that lots of people don't know about, um, which will tell you what typing yes, um, which command typing yes would find. So if I type which yes, it tells me that it's going to use the yes in user bin yes. Um, if you type which something else, um, it will tell you which one it's going to use. This is useful if you want to know where the hell, I don't know, true is or sh or something like this. You don't know where it is on your system, but it's in your path. So you type which and then the command and it will tell you where the hell it is. Um, where is basically looks in a couple of locations, um, default locations for a command. So say you want to know where yes is, but it's not in your path. You can use um, where is yes, and it will tell, it will try and find it in a couple of locations like user bin. Um, it checks the man pages. So you can see here, um, yes is located in user bin yes, and there's a man page for it. Um, what is yes will basically output the first line of the man page. Um, so if you want to know what the hell some command is that you've never seen before, type what is space the command name and you get a one line summary. Um, really quick, useful commands. Lots of people don't know. Um, it's great for um, finding things. Um, who here has compressed files? You've probably all got gzip files around someplace. Um, and it's a real pain to work with them, right? You don't want to have to uncompress them and then edit them. So it turns out people have written versions of all your normal command line tools that use, um, which just take gzip compressed stuff. Zcat is exactly like cat, except it accepts a, um, a compressed file. Zless is exactly like less, except it accepts a gzip file. Um, Vim has a really nice feature. If you Vim a file which is gzipped, it will uncompress it to a temporary directory. You can edit it, and then um, when you save it, it will recompress it and put it back in the location. So you can effectively work with text files which are compressed as if they weren't compressed. Really awesome. Grep, diff, zless. Pretty much everything has a z version of um, of the command. So remember that and don't unzip your things. Who here writes code of some sort? Um, I'm assuming a percentage of you do. Um, grep is a really nice way of finding where the hell certain things are. At grep is nicer. At grep is basically a version of grep that understands coding conventions and does things like color highlighting. So here, for example, I'm at grepping for fix me. And it example, it highlights where it found the command. So um, in this case, it found fix me and it highlighted it. Um, it also highlights the file name, so you can easily see there. Um, it does much um, better things with like Python files or C++ files. Um, it understands how a function works, so you can tell it, please give me all the functions which have fix me in it, and it'll give you the complete context for the function. Um, so if you want to know how to use at grep, um, at get install at grep and then type man at grep and have a look at the options. It's like grep only better. Other great thing is it ignores all those revision control system files that you never want to look in like the .git directory or the .svn. Um, it ignores those. It ignores temporary files created by Vim and things like that. So it's much more naturally gets what you want, not what happens to be there. 
Um, if you're a Python coder, I highly recommend you install IPython. It's like the Python prompt, only nicer. Um, it has things like tab completion. Um, it understands how multi-line things work. So when you press up, instead of getting like each line on the multi-line thing individually, you get the whole thing. Makes it much easier to type functions on the um, command line. It does colors. Um, it's just like the Python prompt, only a bazillion times better. I highly recommend you use it. Uh, as you can see, the last thing is doing tab completion. Much easier way to work with Python modules. Who here does C++ coding? Lots of people. Um, Objump and C++ filt are useful things to use together. Objump will basically list all the um, symbols that are found in a file, but they're in this stupid format that you can't read. It's like underscore Z, N, 30, IS, 10. I mean, I can't read that. But if you pipe it through a thing called C++ filt, it will translate that to your um, C++ commands that you understand. Like, here's an example. Um, that top line has something to do um, like with the object input system. Um, and you can see it's translated it to a much nicer name like OIS Linux mouse hide. I mean, uh, anybody who can understand C++ will understand what the hell that means. Um, so that's a much nicer way to read your output of Objump. Objump's really good for finding where the hell a function might be. If you're coding and you want to know um, which shared object you need to link to, say, get the sign function, you can use Objump ob dump to list all the symbols that are available in a shared object. Um, who's ever, ever had a program just sit there and do nothing? And you're not quite sure what the hell's going on. These um, three commands will help you figure out what the hell's going on. Um, strace basically outputs all the system calls. For those who don't know, system calls are where the user space um, basically calls into the kernel. And this is normally where your program will stall. It will stall at a system call. Um, so this, for example, you can see um, it's in the um, first example, it's stalled on an open. Um, so we know that it's having trouble opening the etcld.so.cache. And it's trying to open it read-only. And it looked like it succeeded, but um, it obviously there's something going on around that file. Um, Ltrace is similar to strace, but instead of um, doing system calls, it does library calls. So say you're using the standard library and you want to find out um, why your program's dying in a read, Ltrace can be a great way to figure that out. This is really useful for coding or if you're a system administrator and you want to know why the hell this is not working. Um, it's, strace is really great because you can find um, out if the program is actually doing useful work or if it's just hung waiting for input for something. Um, you can see if there's lots, you type strace in the command, if there are a lot of things scrolling past that's obviously doing something, if it just stopped, it's waiting for the kernel to do something for you. Um, and that can be really useful in helping debug why the hell this program isn't working. Um, I'd highly recommend doing strace on a file and seeing what it outputs. Um, so strace and executable, seeing what it outputs. Um, things like psfax are great to have a look. It'll help you understand better what your system's doing. Um, if you've got a Mac OS X or Solara system, you can use a thing called dtrace. Um, dtrace allows you to do a bazillion times more advanced things than strace or ltrace. Since I don't have either of those systems, I can't tell you much more than that. 
couple more things. Um, Netstat and LSOF will give you the list of currently open things. Um, Netstat gives you currently open sockets. Um, great if you've got a program that starts up and opens a socket and you don't know what the hell the socket is, you can type Netstat and have a look. Um, and in this example, you can see I've got a couple of um, HTTPS connections open. Um, LSOF um, lists anything that a command has open. So if you type LSOF, you'll see that all these different processes have different files open. Um, I recommend piping it through grep for uppercase listen. We'll find you all the programs that have open sockets. Um, I'm not sure what that LSOF is showing. I was apparently running Firefox, so that was quite a long time ago. Um, so that's all. Um, thank you very much for listening, and I hope you learnt at least one or two useful commands um, tonight. Who's next? out thanks Pete <laughs> I was hoping you wouldn't this is a new one just a learner yeah, it's nice and shiny but it is only new uh, this will be interesting um you've got a PDF on there haven't you no no what no. have you got a Matroska file and an OG file yeah that's not going to play on a Chromebook what can I play it on? I don't know. He needs a laptop. Can I borrow somebody's laptop? Only for a while. Just give me a password. Yeah, if you want to look at a Chromebook. Ah, oh, thanks. Straight out of the rescue. Yeah. I'll let you sort that out for me. Good man. Where's my book? That's up there. There you go. And can we get the um, camera behind me? Yep. As well. Good man. I can actually put it up there. Fantastic. Um, do you want this or you oh, these then? I won't be moving anyway. Um, I'm going to do a two short presentations, both of them which will be nice and easy. Sorry. Thanks, Tim. One of them is on the Kogan ebook, which I decided to buy my wi <coughs> wife because um, she likes to carry lots of books around with her, and this makes it an easy way to carry the books around with her. But it doesn't mean they're all trapped on that device and you can actually use any of these files you can copy off the device onto another device so unlike the <laughs> kindle and other things that people like you're not stuck with whatever it is that you've stuck on being on the only device that you've got it also means that you can copy them off to, sh to give somebody else or to loan to somebody else if you wanted to and given that i don't buy many books that are drm'd in the first place it makes it easier obviously you can strip the drm out and then stick it on here if you want to but I'll bring up a page which just shows the specs. This is quite cheap at the moment. They're selling them for um, $149. Uh, it's about $10 delivered. And I'll just get this up. When it shows me the page, it lists the... Um, oh, do I have to do, do I? Okay. Open with... Oh, is it the... I can't see any. See, I can't see it on here. 
Yeah, oh, as well. I see. No, no, no. If we can put it up there, that's good. Um, I have to put up another All right, thanks, Tim. Yeah. But what I want to do is be able to show this. It's so showing down there, but it's you just can't see there, the image. Can you move the, ma the moose? Can you maybe control Alt Tab, bring it up? Yeah, if I do an Alt Tab. Well, it's not showing it. <laughs> if I can see it. Uh, that top corner there? No, yeah, other corner. This, here. this corner. Uh, okay. Hold on, I'll move. Okay. All right. And if we can get this web page up, for some reason it just doesn't. It's showing yeah, the bottom corner here, but just won't. Stuff here on the screen here. So. Yeah. Uh, you can see it up there. Um, I'm gonna put my glasses on. I can see it. Uh, Oops. Sorry. Oh, I'll go. just give you a run through it at the moment. You can see it actually takes a long time to load. This is the the biggest problem that I have with it. So I tend to leave it on. Yeah. You can see as the screen flashes, and you'll see how long it takes to load. There you go. It'll carry. Uh, we got one of those. Thanks, Shredder. That's what I wanted. Uh, make that bigger there. There we go. Oh, that's another page. Sorry, just give me two seconds, and I'll bring back this page that I wanted. Oh, using other people's machines. There we go. That's what I wanted. Can you do me a favour, Shrita? Oh, I can't control your mouse. <laughs> oh, no, there we go. Strange. Yeah, it's I can do it up here. It's not showing up on the screen, but At it's all. showing up here. Oh, okay. Some oddness with the projector. Yeah, weird. It shows on here, but not on the screen. And what I want to do is get that page there. Because what's happened is... I think it's expanding the display rather than cloning. Yes, it is. Oh, there you go. Got it. No, you had it a second ago. There it is. There. There we go. Thanks very much. Every. Okay, so if I scroll, can I scroll down? Good. I actually can't read that, though. This lists the general specs. This is going to be fun because I can see it or you can see it, but not both of us by the looks. Can you? If you can, because I can't, I can't read it on here and at the... Okay. I'll go in this top right-hand corner. Okay. It weighs very little. I'll come around and show you instead. There it goes. weighs hardly anything at all. You can change the font size really, really easily. Uh, from quite small to quite large. You can read PDF, text, EPUB, Mobi. I can't think what all the large stand standard text. Uh, it'll even read. Is this an uh, NVIDIA? Uh, uh, no, it's .txt not. files. Doc, doc files. You can do it in time to do that. The software I'll show you later on that doesn't come with it. are a little bit clunky on it and <coughs> James and I were just debating about the speed with which it turns pages. He said that the Kindle changes pages quicker. I said that it depends on how fast you read really. You know I tend to start both turning a page when I get about you know, four fifths from the bottom. You know you're a slow reader, you read to the end and then you turn the page, you know. So it depends on how fast you read. To me it's fast enough. I hit the button just before I'm about to finish the page and it turns in time for me. But if you're a speed reader it might be no, I can't fix it on yours, I'm afraid. Okay. If you put it up, I can then see it from... And if you stand there, the stream people can't hear you or see okay. you. Oh, I can read that from here with the glasses on. Okay. Here you go. So this is a general specs. I'd recommend you go to the Kogan site to have a look for yourself just to see the general specs. But it's quite quick. It's got a built-in 2 gig memory. You can put additional memory cards into it. Here are all the different formats that it supports, PDF, CHM, EPUB, text, HGM, HTML, uh, rich text formats as well, etc, 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 etc. So it will read quite a few different formats. If you get a DRM uh, document, you strip it out, you can then convert it to be read on this quite easily. It does it very simply. Um, it's a black and white screen only, it's a grayscale screen only, so you can't look at colour photographs, except in grayscale. Um, it will play back MP3s, I suppose if you like listening to music whilst you're reading your books. It claims it's got about a 10,000 uh, screen refresh rate, so you know, you know, even if you said it was four-fifths of that, it's still quite a lot before you actually have to recharge it. Um, I've had it for a few weeks now, probably about two weeks. And, uh, to me that seems, you know, if it went on for about two or three months and you didn't have to recharge it, that's a pretty good rate. 
Uh, definitely means you can go on holidays quite easily and not have to worry about it. It comes with, my favourite, it comes with 1,500 books already. Um, to be fair, probably about six or seven of those I would read. Uh, some of them are books by authors I've heard of, but I've not heard of the book, and some of them are authors I've never heard of and never heard of the book either. And some of them I would definitely say would be things that were published a long time ago and somebody may have taken interest in them. But you can quite easily get from places like Gutenberg. Um, you can quite easily get the, uh, a lot of books that I would read, for instance, or even just looking on the web. So like Moliere's The Misanthrope, which I downloaded on that. Seriously, if you ever want to read something that's hilariously funny, read either The School for Wives or The Misanthrope uh, by Moliere. Absolutely brilliantly funny. Definitely up there with people like Shakespeare. It's extraordinarily humorous. Even the translated from French into English, they're able to keep the rhythm really uh, clear too. So you can co collect a lot of books uh, that you may want to read, but you don't want to go around looking for them in a second-hand bookstore, and you can get them for free instead. There are also a lot of ways of, a lot of uh, places where you can get books from uh, e-ink, uh, e uh, e uh, sorry, electronic books that you can get, which are very, very cheap. My view about electronic books is that if I pay more than a couple of dollars for it, it's too expensive. You buy the paperback for five or ten dollars, why not buy that? Because you can sell it, you can give it a book away, you can loan it to somebody else. The problem with sort of DRM material is you can't do any of that, um, which to me means that they should be worth about 20 or 30 cents to you because they restrict your rights enormously. The one reason I like the Kogan is because you can put anything on it that, you, that it will read and you can take it back off again. You can do anything with the files that you like. You're not restricted to that machine, uh, so you don't lose anything. Um, it's, it runs Linux, which is the only reason why I'm presenting it here today, otherwise I wouldn't. Um, where is it up to just at the moment? Uh, hands up. Oh, there you go. Um, you can see quite a, there's a little menu button at the top right hand side which gives you easy access to things. There's a, a favorites tab which is what I use. It's very, very slow to read all the books that are already on there. It takes ages for it to load them all. I don't find navigating around that, that simple. You really need to know what you're looking for or you've got to flick through. The search function works pretty well. And once you've, you've found it, it'll actually put it into the history of books you've looked for and then you can decide that that's a favorite. It'll also save whatever page that we were on last. So you, you put the machine away somewhere, get, pick it up, it goes back to the last page that you were on. You can quite easily skip forwards and backwards in it, and I'll do text searches as well for you. Um, I downloaded some book that my wife had for um, her book club, and she's been quite happy to read it on that. Every now and again, it will when you convert a book, and I'll show you the software if I can get that back up here now. Uh, here we go, Ooh, mouse. Can Tim, can you get me this video up here? I'll show you the software uh, that's on this. Oh, hello, James. You look just like James. Tim? <laughs> Thanks. I can't get this to do that. I just want to pull either of those two. Preferably that one there. Oh, it's ugly as. It's in the shell there, isn't it? Oh, there it is. Can you make that bigger? <coughs> Good man. All right. Is pause. Should pause it. No, it plays it. Okay. Let's pause. Um, to go onto the software that you can interact, you can just plug that in and use it as a straight out uh, external drive and swap files backwards and forwards onto it if you want to. It's very simple. Um, but what you can also do is use this software I'm about to show you called Caliber. Um, it's absolutely seriously fantastic. Uh, you plug it in. As soon as you plug the machine in, that will find the, that will find your device. And I'll, I'll, what I've done is heavily edited the video that the guy created himself, which is about 10 minutes long. So I've heavy, heavily edited this video. He'll explain a bit about it, and I'll pause it at a couple of points just so that you can. I'll explain a bit more. If we no, I've got no audio, have we? Uh, okay. I don't want. Is that? Uh, where is it? There? Yeah, that would be it. And it will be this one. And now there. Is that it? Try that. No. Do you have volume turned on? Oh, it's not mine. Okay, let's try it. Calibre was designed to make managing your email. Comes out there. Coming out. It helps if you plug it in. That one. <laughs> try this one then. Nope. 
Marvel's comics, what have you. The first time you start Caliber, you will be greeted by the Caliber Welcome Wizard. Start by telling Caliber where you would like it to store your books. Every time you add a book to Caliber, it will be stored in the folder you choose here. If you do not like the default selection, you can change it by clicking the Change button. The next step is to tell Caliber what ebook device you have. As you can see, Caliber supports uh, devices from all the major manufacturers. If the device that you possess is not on this list, choose one of the generic devices, and most probably Caliber will work with your well with your device regardless. With the with the Kogan, all I had to do was plug it in. Didn't have to do anything. Didn't have to fiddle around with it. Didn't have to change a thing. It just worked immediately. That's it. You have now finished configuring Caliber and are ready to start using it to manage your collection. This is the main Caliber interface. Here you can add books to Caliber. You can edit their metadata, which means changing their title, authors, covers, etc. You can convert them from one ebook format to another. When you edit metadata, it'll actually search for net. You say, this is the book I've got, and it will give you a list of that, that book, the different publishers, the different publication dates, even if, say, it's a, a book from a non -English, uh, non uh, not an English language and it's been translated, it'll then tell you this is a list of the translations available, which is yours. As soon as you select that, it will then download all the information about that version of that book onto the device, or into the application, rather. Caliber supports all the major ebook formats. If you want to read a book on your computer, you can do so with Caliber's built-in viewer, which again supports all the ebook formats. You can ask Caliber to go out on the net and download news from websites like the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, etc., and convert it into an ebook, which you can read on your reader. Finally, if you're looking to buy an ebook, Caliber has a useful feature called Get Books, which allows you to enter the title and author of the book you're looking for, and Caliber will go out and search all the ebook sellers' websites to find the lowest priced edition for you. Now it's got about uh, 30 different uh, sites that it will search uh, automatically. It'll also tell you whether it's DRM'd as well as telling you what the price is as well, which is pretty good. So here's one of the ones that, that's actually one of the ones that I downloaded for my wife, Pride and Prejudice. It'll give you the book cover, you can alter all the information in the different tags, give it a rating, whether you like it a lot, whether you don't like it very much why you'd actually then keep it, I really don't know. <laughs> uh, you can change the title, author, um, uh, the series, if you've got a series of books by a particular author that relates to some story, uh, I don't know, off the top of my head, um, which one you might want, but then you can put the series version in as well. Um, and you can, as you can see, all the different buttons down the corner here, uh, you can download different cover versions as well if you'd like to, you don't like the one that it automatically downloads for you. Now let me show you a few ways that you can use Caliber to browse your large collection of books. The first way is, is to browse it by covers. You can open the cover browser in Caliber by clicking the Browse Covers button down here at the bottom right of the interface. Now this is just cute. As you can see, this brings up a view of the books in your library by cover. You can scroll through this view. And this is particularly useful if you believe in judging a book by its cover. Another way to to browse through your collection is by using the Tag Browser, which is this area on the left of the screen. So as you can see down the left-hand side there, you can browse by authors, by the series, formats, publishers, any sort of tags that you add to something as well, um, uh, any sort of identification uh, that you've got for it. The little, this little window in the middle where you can just flick through your books is very cute. Um, oh, and the other thing too was, uh, where are we? It's really easy to remove books, but it also asks you, do you want to remove the book from the device? Do you want to remove the book from the ebook library? Or do you want to remove it both from the device and the ebook library? So it's quite clear. It's very hard to accidentally remove it from somewhere that you want to remove it, uh, so that you don't want to remove it from. It gives you quite a few options. So not burn the to burn the book to something else? <laughs> That'd be an idea, wouldn't it? <laughs> oh, what are you going to choose? Fahrenheit 451. <laughs> That's the, the site um, for the software, and that was a heavily, very heavily edited version of the one. The, guy, the one the uh, guys created is about 10 minutes. It's very, com very comprehensive, very easy to follow. You seriously don't even need to look at the video to understand how to use it. It is dead simple. Nice big buttons, nice colourful interface, very pretty. 
Uh, my wife likes to just click on buttons. That's what she likes to do. Click on a button, it does something. Clicks on that button, it does something else. That's exactly what that is. You click on a button, it does something. It will copy the books to wherever you want to copy them to and from. It will create different versions. You could have, um, you could convert the book into several different formats, as you can see, um, and it will show you all of those versions in the one place. You don't have to go looking for the different version that you've created. That is the Kogan ebook reader, and that's Calibre. And like I said, once you've installed it, you plug in the device. It's got a, a, um, a micro USB plug, and um, it recognizes the book right away. You decide that you want to send books to the device. You just say, these are the books I want to send, and you click on send, and it just sends them and tells you when it's finished. Fantastic, very easy to use. Definitely recommend the ebook reader, and absolutely recommend Calibre for um, using it as a, an ebook. Um, storage and uh, library. Thanks very much. Turn it that way. Okay, there we go. You can see the little sort of chiclety type buttons down the right hand side and these two big buttons down the left. You can use the left buttons for left and right functions. And just down the bottom, when I've dropped one of the books, uh, let's see, we'll go uh, Crime and Punishment, just for the sake of it. It's a rather large book, so sometimes it takes a bit of time to load. Like I said, this is the only problem with it. Once, you read it, once you're in the book, it's fine. Uh, it's going to. Uh, there we go. So I've got it on very large text at the moment, as you can see. But you've got a menu function here, so you can change the zoom to something a bit more reasonable. There we go. That's a bit more reasonable. You can also rotate the page as well, like that. If for some reason you wanted to, can't imagine why you would, but you know, if that's what you like doing. You can also, um, let's go back here one, oops, sorry, go back up to the menu. Nope, it's gone back too far. Like I said, once you're in the book reading it, it's fine. It's just the transitioning between switching it on and getting into the book. I tend just to leave it on. I mean, every, most people are aware that with e-ink readers, it uses power to change pages. It doesn't use any power to hold the page. So leaving it on, some people have commented it takes a long time to shut down. Well, there's no reason to shut it down because it actually doesn't use power at all. It will close down after several minutes all by itself if you leave it alone, but it's not actually saving you any power by turning it off. It's a very strange thing to want to do. Um, in the menu, you've also got optional settings as well, like uh, changing the font size. You can change the coding if you wanted to. You can change margins. Hyphenation. I found with a couple of books that every now and again what you've got to do is actually change the encoding to actually read properly. On a couple of books, weirdly, it will not show you double L's until you change the coding. It's very odd. I don't know why that, that's the case. It just doesn't show double L's, and it's very odd with a couple of books that I've, that I've had. But it t like I said, a lot of the books that we tend to, that I've got on, on my wife's device, <laughs> <laughs> tend to be classics anyway that I've got off Gutenberg Press and I didn't want to go around hunting down the book. Or we've got the tech the book somewhere in the house. We have a, probably four and a half, five thousand books at home, probably a bit more than that. And every now and again I can't find something, so what I've decided to do instead is download the electronic version. I know where it is, it's really easy. I don't have to go hunting for it. It's dead simple. <laughs> Sorry? Poor trees. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Oh, these are, you know, like, yeah, well, they are made out of paper. You can also, as it said, download um, uh, using Calibre. You can also download um, um, newspaper, uh, electronic versions of the paper like the Sydney Morning Herald. It'll convert them and put them on this for you as well. It's got, as I pointed out to a couple of people before, just on the back there, it's got a little reset hole. The paper clip works well in that. The first day I had it, within the space of about two hours, the device froze. And I could not. And the thing is, is that you don't. You actually don't know what it's doing because it uses no power, so the page doesn't change or move. It just shows you the one page and nothing else. 
So I had to reset it three times. That was more than two weeks ago. It's never happened since. So I was literally about to pack it up and send it back. It just stopped doing it. I have no idea why it was doing it, but it seems very happy now. Like I said, it's very light. Yeah, they sell it to you. It comes with one of these little holders for it as well, which are cute too because it protects the screen. Um, like I said, I definitely recommend it if you want to have more control. If you want to have something like this, but you want to have more control over the books that you read and what you do with those books and how you manage them than all of the other devices that are out there generally, um, I'd definitely get one of these. So can I just speak anywhere, or is there, do I have to speak into the microphone? I need to speak into the microphone. Oh, that's much better. Okay. Um, now, if I can get out of this video. And now, my apologies for the technical malfunction on the laptop. Um, I only got this a couple of days ago, and I'm not quite used to it. Um, although, I could probably go... display on monitors is what I want. Let's do that. Okay. Um, oops, wrong key. There we go. Okay, so my name is Srita. I'm the technical manager at One Laptop Per Child Australia. Um, and we just had our second anniversary. In fact, I believe it's today. Barry, is that correct? Is it today? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, and uh, we, we, we had a little shindig yesterday and um, we gave a bit of a presentation. I thought I'd um, relate that to the slug crowd as well. Um, so, second anniversary, we had a cake and everything, it was nice and fun. Um, well, you always start small and then you grow, but uh, you know, some great companies have started, started as a you know, couple of guys in a garage. Um, in our case it was a bedroom. And we end up with this. Um, so we're, we're essentially bringing educational opportunities to kids who don't um, who don't have the same opportunities as they as you would in um, urban Australia. Um, it's it's a market that a lot of a, a lot of companies that the um, that I suppose the the cap the capitalist model would would consider to be too hard. Um, no place to make a profit, that sort of thing, whereas we see it as an area to that, that needs the most. Um, and we're a not-for-profit, so we're not in it to make money. We're not in it to, to do the easiest, the easiest thing. We're, we're actually trying to achieve the most amount of good we can. And this is ba that's basically what we're trying to do overall. There are three main groups that we're trying to satisfy. We've got kids. Obviously, we want to improve this state of education for children. We want to provide them with opportunities that they might not have otherwise. Then teachers. The teachers are, in many cases, the gateways to the kids. We work with the school environments. We, um, we make sure that the teachers are up to speed and that they can use the, the XO devices that are being passed around the room for actual um, educational outcomes. Um, and then finally, there's the community. The, um, the, the community is what the kids go home to. It's what they wake up with in every day. Um, um, yes, fine, you, 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 can, you can target the school, but then you're only targeting 9 to 3 uh, p.m. You, uh, you want to make sure that the, ki that the kids are, um, are constantly immersed in, in in the exos and in the opportunity that we can give them, we want to make sure that the communities are uh, um, engaged with what we're trying to do. Um, they're enabled. We try to support their languages and cultures and all that as much as we can. 
Um, now, since we're two years old, it might be worthwhile looking over what we've done over the past couple of years. Um, so that's, that's some information on the number of XOs that we've, we've given. So at the end of financial year 2010, 1270, we've, we've gone up now to, to 3716. So we've, we've got about 5,000 XOs out there. Our overall target is to hit 400,000 by 2014 because that's the number of children in, uh, in uh, outer regional remote and very remote, remote Australia. Is it going to go to the next one? There we go. Um, and that's a map of the kinds of places we've been going to. As you can see, they're the places that you can't get to on your normal daily commute. They are often very difficult to get to. It involves multiple planes, um, um, long drives, and so on. Um, and consequently, they're very hard to service. And like I said, the, the, the free market tends to forget about them. And as an indication of the kinds of circumstances these children live in, there's, there's an index of community socio-educational um, advantage. And if you look at Knox Grammar, for example, that's, that's at over 1,200. And the schools that we go after are half that. So they've got far less resources and opportunity than, than the kids on the, the coasts of Australia where, where the metropolitan centres are. Training, essential part of what we do. You can't do anything without training. We're not about, we're, we're not a computer company. We're not about selling kit and then buggering off. We really want to make sure these things are used in the classroom to achieve educational goals over a long period of time. We, uh, we're about sustainability. So we want, to, we want to make sure that teachers get trained. Um, we want to make sure that teachers are enabled and supported um, over the whole course of the, of the children's education. Um, on, only then can, can you really achieve real effect. Um, so that, that's a bit more information on the kind of um, impact that we've had. Um, out. We've, we've been, as a young organisation, we're, we're constantly improving the ways we do things and we've, um, we've now settled on an online teaching model for the, for the teachers. And that's, that's allowed us to achieve a lot of scale with enabling the teachers. They, they've, they've, come, um, they, they've, they've come on board, they've gone through their training course, and then we can, then, then they're, they're, um, they, they understand the XOs a lot more. They understand how to manage them in a classroom environment. They understand much better how to, how to actually use them to, to achieve the outcomes that they need to. Um, now, I'm going to play a short video. Um, so we've already got the AV plugged in, so that's great. Uh, how's the volume? That's max. Um, that goes for just under five minutes, and um, you, you can stop hearing from me for a moment and listen to, the, to what some of the teachers are saying in remote Australia. Philanthropic attentions of some of Australia's biggest companies. The One Laptop Per Child organisation was formed in the United States five years ago to create an affordable educational device for use in developing countries. One Laptop Per Child is trying to boost numeracy and literacy rates in these remote communities, giving each child an educational laptop. So far, 1,500 laptops have been delivered to children in remote parts of the Northern Territory in Western Australia with a plan to distribute 400,000 over the next five years. Laptops are great for kids. They're set up like um, a game. I mean, when they open them, it looks fun. It's engaging. They can see everyone else that's online. They can chat with each other and they can play games with each other. And I think, yeah, that connection is really nice. Um, 
it'll be a very big change for our students when they're using these laptops because when, when we were going through school and we didn't have the have these advantages like these children are going to have. One laptop per child program will just provide them with an exposure to new technologies so that they can um, use that technology for things that they are interested in doing. Students here, the world ends here, but there's a big world out there. in the classroom has enabled the kids to learn significant computer skills, um, accessing the internet as well as word processing. So really overall I think the EXO, in our, EXO experience in our school has been amazing. Um, the support we've received from ILPC has been wonderful and I'm just absolutely honoured to be able to participate in this program in our school. programs on them are suitable for all ages, all learning styles as well. The students are going to take the XO and they're going to take ownership of their own learning. I think it's a powerful tool, it's a powerful resource. The students are just going to go full force with it. The way the world is working, if you want to get a job anywhere, especially if it's off the morning to island, those kids are really going to have to have a really good understanding of technology. So I think in that way, it will really help connect them to hopefully future jobs. Having the EXOs at Manangrida School has been somewhat of a technological revelation. With over 200 devices shared between the hub school and the homeland school, it's just been so exciting to see students and teachers engage with the EXOs. They use the cameras um, that look at their cell phone, like make funny faces and stuff, and like I try not to laugh. They are having fun with it. What I would like to say to the corporate partners that uh, have been involved in this program, I'd like to say thank you on behalf of Bloomingdale State School and behalf, on behalf of our children and the children of the other schools that are benefiting from this uh, initiative. Our children, while they are remote, need to be able to engage in these technologies so they have an equal chance as everyone else in Australia and the world to engage in that global economy. So that's that. Uh, and um, before I get into what we're doing over the next financial year, um, I'll just emphasise, I think one of the videos mentioned um, that 1,500 XOs have been distributed. That, that report was um, it's on a TV show called The 7pm Project. That was a year ago. So now we're past 5,000. Um, and a another, another point I, I, I like to stress is that we are very much an education project, um, and so the EXOs aren't about teaching kids how to use a computer or how to how to become an office drone or anything like that. It really is about making sure that kids get educated in their literacy and their numeracy and that sort of stuff. In the 21st century, we should be thinking beyond pens and paper and um, and textbooks. We really should be thinking about how we can digitise this and make things interactive um, and collaborative as well. Um, the EXOs aren't just devices on, in their own right, they also talk with each other over a network and in fact they can create their own, their own networks as well. Um, so you're not tied to school infrastructure or anything like that. Um, so moving on to 2012, what's, what's coming up for us? Um, we, we need the support of the public, we need the support of you guys to, to really make this happen. Um, we are a charity. Um, um, obviously money doesn't grow on trees and so we're, and, and we're not just looking for money, we're looking for support and help in, in, in any, any way. Um, and there, there are some, uh, various ways in which we're, which we're doing that. There's plenty of information on our, on our website if you go to laptop.org.au. Um, and um, that, that's, a, 
that's a sense of the scale that we're trying to, to work with. 400 teachers, 10,000 children. Um, we, we want to do that over the, over the next 12 months and we're accelerating. We are, we are growing at a very fast rate. Um, to hit 400,000 children, we obviously need to go at a faster rate than this. And um, so far we've been doing very well with our targets and there's nothing to suggest that we, um, that we won't hit our targets in the future. Um, and so our, our primary focus is over the next year to, um, to grow and expand. Um, in addition to getting support from the general public is that's one side of things but the other side is actually on the ground we need to, we need to help the existing teachers that are they already have XOs they are already doing great things with them and then we also need to, to grow the pie we need to attract to attract more make it m m make um, OPC um, a program that is that is that is viable um, and not not just not just in terms of the functionality of the XOs um, but also in, in terms of how, how well it works in the classroom, how well it fits the community and those, those things. Um, we, are, we are building a new website for educational purposes to, to assist teachers and to provide information to the public as well about what we're doing on it in our educational space. We're putting together um, help resources, tutorial videos and that sort of thing. And that's, that's going to be up at education.laptop.org.au. So that's, that's kind of what it looks like at the moment. And, and um, yeah, these, these EXOs are, f are delivered free to the schools um, and um, it's, a lot of it is, is sponsored through, through corporates and, and donations and other forms of assistance. And this is my area because I'm, I'm technical manager. Obviously these, these EXOs have software on them and um, the software needs to be maintained and updated and developed and so on. In Australia, we're part of the global old PC community um, and there are various ways to assist. If you go to that website there, dev.laptop.org.au slash participate, um, there are, there are um, there's means and um, ways for you to get involved, development, testing, documentation, you know, fi finding bugs, that sort of thing. Um, there's a technical technical mailing list where people can can discuss matters um, and and ask questions. And um, yeah, that's it. So th uh, thank you very much. Um, now that I'll I'll leave that those exos around to circulate. By all means, play around with them. If you've got questions, you can you can grab me. And um, I believe my friend Patrick has a word to say as well. Shridhar was kind enough to loan us a couple for a very short period of time. I have three children, the eldest two at primary school, and they brought some friends around. So there's about uh, eight, nine primary school kids came around to have a look at these machines. They absolutely loved them. My kids, obviously, are going to be quite competent at using computers, but they, they're designed for kids. They're kid size, kid scales, as you can see by looking at it. It's a perfect fit for their hands. The applications that were on them they found really, really intriguing. So these, my kids, like I said, use computers quite a lot for good reasons and not so good reasons, but they found the, the exiles absolutely fantastic. They love them. And I can see why they're really popular at schools very, very easily because they're so useful, but they engage kids quite quickly. And because they're designed for their size, they're very, very easy for them to use as well. Everything's just the right scale for their hands. Thanks, Rita. And um, next up is... <laughs> yeah, we can we can leave it up. Whatever the Google product is that doesn't browse. Let me just exit that. And um yeah. And then start the mode in top we're gonna have a shop break for this is sorry. And there's things here. So you get out of the sound of the dollars. That's right. I should give Patrick back his stick first. See what's so challenging about this? No. Mm. 
Um, yeah, click there. Click there. Yeah. No, it doesn't seem to be doing anything. Control line. <laughs> yeah. Um, I suppose if I do this. Buttons don't work, Sharida. Uh, oh, they should. Oh, something happened. I can't left click. Mm. Yeah, this yeah, works for me a moment ago. Type the URL in the Google box and search. That will probably bring it up for you. Which buttons are you using? Are you using I tried that one and that one. Oh. It was working a moment Seems ago. To, yeah. Right button works. Ah, oh, maybe it's upset that. <laughs> Should we try escape and see what happens? No. Maybe something Your is left stuck. mouse button doesn't work. Well. Well, I used it to unmount the stick and everything, so. Oh, that's good. Whatever that is. No, no left mouse button, Shreda. You broke my laptop, man. <laughs> <laughs> so does the OLPC have a. It doesn't have a browser on it? Yes, it does. It does. It has, um, yeah, it's called Browse. It's basically a wrapper around Gecko, so Firefox and you name it. I could just but internet access, so could I do it on there? Would uh, that work? I don't have the adapter, it doesn't have a VGA port. Okay. Oh, yeah. 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 Have we just read enough from the file? If you hit that, it doesn't really fit that well. The menu. No. Uh, How about we'll have the break now? Yeah, yeah. great idea. Uh, great <laughs> Sorry, guys, my laptop's <laughs> brand new. <laughs> <laughs> what did you press? I tried escape. You pressed this one though, right? No, I didn't touch that one. So that should actually switch to. It's not coming back to here either, is it? Oh, I didn't see how hard that is. I put the screen off. I didn't see a thing. Oh, I can left click now. No, I can't left click in Firefox. I can left click there. Can't left click here. Can't left click anywhere. Why did you buy a Dell, Sharita? No, I <laughs> okay, at least I've got it both on the same screen now. Sharina, how do I, like, your network's not working now. Um, are you trying to connect it with the guest? Well, no, the it's gone. No, the reason why it's gone is that it's actually being managed from my other account, which is still logged in. Um, I'm going to yank this out for the purposes of that. Um, and I'm never going to get it back now. <laughs> a separate account for presenting. Makes sense. 
Okay. Where do you? Margarina, where you going? Yeah, no, I want her to get it up so I can prove it works. Well, I've got it working, but because your display doesn't have any other mode, I can't set it. I can't set it to the same res. I can get it to mirror. I just can't set this to the same resolution as that. So a mirror mode, you full screen doesn't go full screen. And it was the same. It was the previous generation of the same model. That's good enough, isn't it? Uh, okay, what we've got, it works, but that screen is has nothing on it, okay. and you have to look up there. Is that a problem? Yeah, it's it's not, I'll try. No, that should be okay. I don't need to type very much. As long as... Uh,